Hey guys and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here welcome to my channel my name is Kim and I upload videos once a week about Lolita fashion and other Japanese street fashion related content I also sprinkle in some wedding planning videos and I am now doing a Japan planning series and this will be the second video in that series if you're new to this channel and you're not subscribed go ahead and hit that subscribe button because I would appreciate all the love and support that you could give me because you know you're gonna want to watch more of these videos so just go ahead and come on over like I mentioned this is going to be the second video in my Japan planning series this is gonna be a big one not sure if you looked at the timestamp I talk a lot in my videos anyway so just be prepared for that I will be talking all about how I planned my first trip to Japan in October of 2019 I have left timestamps in the description box of the different portions of this video that I'll be talking about so feel free to skip around to the portions that you are more interested in I mean really I would just appreciate if you just let the whole video play but I understand if you want to skip around just so long as you're here for a little bit just just stick around for a little bit grab a drink grab a snack prop up your feet and let's get into the video so first thing that I would recommend you do if you have never ever planned a trip to Japan you've never been before, the first thing I would recommend that you do, ask yourself and your travel buddies, why do you want to go to Japan in the first place? So maybe you just want to go because you like Japanese food or maybe you want to shop, maybe you want to see some architecture, maybe you want to do all of that. Great. At least get a good idea for what is motivating you to go because that is going to influence when you purchase your tickets, what you choose to do on your trip, and what time of year you decide to go, as well as what kind of accommodations you're going to book. All of those are going to be heavily influenced by the reasons why you want to go. Just kind of sit down with your travel buddies if you're thinking of doing a group trip, which I recommend you do a group trip. I did one and it was like the bomb.com. bomb.com.biz.org.edu. Your next question will likely be, what, a, what when do I book my flight? What are, what's a good deal for a flight? Like, what, what are we looking at travel-wise? What are we looking at cost-wise to even get to Japan in the first place? I'm going to assume that the majority of people watching this video are in the United States because I've looked at my analytics and that's where the majority of y'all are coming from. You're likely gonna be looking at a long-haul flight, which means your flight is going to be over eight hours in length. I'd say anywhere between $900 to $1,200 round trip for a flight to Japan. Now, yes, that's expensive. However, there are a couple of things you can do to get that cost down. One of them is going to be to sign up for a flight alert on an app like Hopper or a service like Scott's Cheap Flights. We had booked our flights through Scott's Cheap Flights, which is just a free service. You can pay for the premium, which I do recommend if you can swing it. And you give it your home airports or airports you want to watch flight notifications coming out of. And it, it just like it pretty much just does like Google searches for you, Google flight searches for you. And it just kind of monitors that. But it does it in a way where it's com it's like succinct and it emails you and it tells you, hey, around this time frame, like, this airport has flight deals going to this location. And we hadn't even thought about planning a trip to Japan. We went to Japan because the flights were on sale. Flights went on sale from Portland, Oregon to Tokyo, Japan for $534 round trip, which is a screaming good deal considering half the time you can't even get round trip tickets from the West Coast to the East Coast for that cheap. The caveat with Scott's cheap flights though is that you can't tell it a specific time frame. It tells you the time frame. So if you're someone that you can kind of travel, you don't, you aren't restricted to specific times a year that you can travel. An uh, option like that is going to be really great. If you know that you generally want to go in a specific time of year, or you know you can only travel like during the summer, you can use a service like Google Flights and set up flight alerts to kind of monitor flight price changes to let you know when flights go down in price or they go up in price. Okay, and next tips about flights. Two things you're gonna wanna consider when you're booking your flights. First one, I would strongly recommend that you book a flight that has the shortest travel time. We booked our flights and yes, they were $534, but we had a layover in Dallas, which was the opposite direction. Dumb. The flight 
from Dallas to Narita was 13 hours. You also have to factor in all of the work and all of the time it took to travel from Portland to Dallas. So that was just like wasted time. So again, in hindsight, I would make sure I look at the layover airport to make sure I'm not wasting a bunch of time as well as looking for the shortest flight possible. Next tip I would strongly recommend if you have the budget and can swing it is to upgrade for extra leg room. 13 hours on a flight is a long time. And if you don't do international traveling very often, <clears throat> myself, your legs are gonna get cramped and most resources will recommend that you get up and stretch often, which is cool. But if it's a very full flight, you're gonna have a lot of other people getting up and stretching often as well. We upgraded for extra leg room so we had the ability to stretch out our legs. We could prop our feet up on our backpacks in front of us and that was really nice. But in addition to that, we were also able to stand up in front of our seats at actual height and be able to just stretch right in front of our seats. So that was really great. It was about $250 to upgrade our seats, which to some people that just might be like a waste of money. But I, if you have the budget for it, I would strongly recommend it, especially if you're looking at a flight that's over 10 hours in length. I think if our flight was under 10 hours, I probably wouldn't have done it, but 13 hours is a long time to be sitting around and back problems and butt problems and all kinds of that. So I also have additional tips about just like flying in general, especially for people who are nervous flyers. I am a nervous flyer. I have an irrational fear of flying. So um, I do have plenty of tips and suggestions for people who do suffer with flight anxiety, especially when you're thinking about traveling on a plane and being on a plane for a long period of time. Um, the <laughs> Most of my tips are going to be centered around going to your doctor and getting some good drugs. But again, um, that could be a whole separate video. did we figure out where to go and how long to book our trip? We spent 12 days and 11 nights in Japan total and we did what I call the big three which is Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka which I feel like is perfect for our first time we're going to Japan. The cities aren't too far away that you're spending a ton of time traveling on the Shinkansen. We booked our trip and we figured out flights really just based on prices and how long we thought enough time would be. Seven days I feel like was not going to be enough time to do those three big cities so we ended up making it 12 days which was honestly perfect I would probably do that again if I booked it again so the first thing we did was we booked our flights because the flight was the motivating factor for us to go after that we started thinking about what did we want to do in Japan we sat down and we said what are the five to ten top things that if we go to Japan and we don't do them, we'll be super bummed out. When we kind of made that list, I then made a spreadsheet and I made a tab for just like things to do. Then I highlighted all of the top five things that we wanted to do. I then did a bunch of research with the help of Japan Travel Guide and a couple Japan specific travel books and I figured out where are these different places. And I then did some mapping to figure out, well, how close are these things together? And we tried to group things together that were relatively close to each other and wouldn't require a ton of traveling. I went a little ham building our itinerary and in hindsight, I don't think I would do that again and I would not recommend it. This, this was too much. This was a lot of stuff and we were go, go, go and we didn't leave room to explore and I will not be doing this again and I would not recommend it unless you are an experienced traveler or you just, you, you want to burn your feet out. If you want to burn your feet out, like go ahead, but yeah. The major things that we knew we wanted to do on our trip were the Golden Pavilion, the Bamboo Forest, the Starbucks in Kyoto that is the traditional Japanese um, architecture, um, Tadaji Temple, Himeji Castle, Osaka Castle, exploration around Dotonbori and Sumeda Sky Building, the Tsukiji Outer Market, as well as Fushimi Inari. Those were all of our super major popular attractions, but we also sprinkled in shopping. We sprinkled in a bunch of other smaller things, specific restaurants that we wanted to go to, we also sprinkled in there. And we were able to do all those big things. 
as a first time traveler, I'm so glad we spent three dedicated days in each city because you can easily spend a week in Tokyo or you can easily spend a week in Kyoto just because there's so much to offer and there's so many different things in each city. So some people will tell you, oh, if you stay in Kyoto, you can just do a day trip to Osaka or if you stay in Osaka, you can day trip to Kyoto. If you're like, I wanna go to Fushiminari and I wanna do Kyo Mizudera and I wanna do the Bamboo Forest and I wanna do the Golden Pavilion and I wanna do Nishiki Market, and you're only doing a day trip, you're going to overdo it and you're gonna wear yourself out halfway through that list. I do recommend making sure you spend at least two days, if you can, in each major city because there's just so much to offer and doing three days will leave you room to explore as well. Things that we use to create our itinerary, there was a Facebook group that I joined called Japan travel planning. That was a very good resource. There are a lot of people in that group and there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of the same questions being asked. However, there is a search bar, which I highly recommend if you have specific questions or need specific recommendations. The biggest benefit I got from that group was different travel sites to book things such as kluke.com. I think that's how we booked our um, Wi-Fi and that's how we also booked our bus ticket and our train ticket back to the airport. So that was a good resource for that. That group was also really, really, really good for honest recommendations for places to eat, bars. And I found out about a couple really good restaurants as well as a really clutch bar from that Facebook group. So if you are looking for more of an experience where you get to interact with locals and do some off the beaten path or not so popular things, join a group like that and find suggestions. Another resource that I used to plan our trip was books. I actually bought some physical books, which I love physical books because I can look at pictures, I can sit in bed, my eyes can get a break from looking at computer screens. And there were three books that I used to plan this trip. One of those books is this book called Things I Wish I Knew Before Going to Japan. This was written by a local tour guide. I think they're a tour guide couple. And I got this off of Amazon and it feels pretty genuine and authentic as far as suggestions. And it does break down um, some itineraries that you could do based on the number of days as well as prefectures that you're visiting. So that was really great. Some of their suggestions are pretty like, well, no kidding. But some of them also I didn't really see recommended very much in some of the other books I've looked at. The other two resources that I used were these two books by Eyewitness Travel. This one is called, this book is called Top 10 Tokyo. And then from the same publisher, I just have the big Japan book. These books were really helpful for being able to visualize things. I liked these books because they had really nice pictures. They had suggestions. There's also recommendations for like hotels and restaurants, which I didn't really follow, but you can if you need that information and help. This book was actually, the Top 10 Tokyo book was actually extremely helpful because there were suggestions in this book for things to do that I didn't really think about. Like I found out about the Samurai Museum from this book actually, and that was one of our favorite things that we did on our trip. Yeah, I did use physical books. Can't say enough good things about physical books. But then again, there's a lot of really good resources on the internet if you just look for Japan planning. I also followed a couple YouTubers for their videos. They have some, there are some amazing videos on YouTube around Japan travel planning and itinerary and things to do. The two specific ones that I used really heavily were Kim Dao. She's like OG, been on YouTube for a minute, been making Japan videos for years and she, made a lot of videos about Liz Lisa when no one else was really talking about Liz Lisa. So I got a lot of suggestions and tips and advice from her videos. Another person that I follow is Renata Piera. I think she has a travel channel with her and her husband and she has a bunch of videos on Japan. She has videos in Tokyo and Osaka and Yokohama and they were very, very helpful. She 
talks a lot about the food, the different attractions and travel things and things like that. We also leveraged our friends who have been to Japan. We have friends that have been to Japan several times. Like I mentioned, I went with a group of friends. So we had a group for a Facebook group for that to discuss our plans and things we wanted to do. And I also have friends that live in Japan and they gave me a lot of really good advice. So leverage your friends, leverage your family and talk to them to get some really good, honest suggestions and opinions about Japan traveling and planning. Another thing about building your itinerary is you, if you are going to things that require tickets like Studio Ghibli Museum, or if you're going to any distilleries, you need to buy those tickets months ahead of time. So don't slot those things in on your itinerary thinking, oh, I'll just get tickets like when we get there. No, you're not. We booked tickets for the Yamazaki Distillery, which was one of the best $10 we spent on our entire trip. But the tickets went on sale months ahead of time. It was just as bad. It was almost as bad as an Angelic Pretty release, to be honest. Like it was very stressful. The tickets sold out in like 10, 15 minutes. And those are all things that you need to buy months and months ahead of time. Set an alarm, be prepared. Just be prepared to buy those tickets months ahead of time to make sure that when you slot it into your itinerary, you're not just going thinking that um, you'll be able to get in because there are a lot of things that do require ticket purchases before you even Bef months ahead of time, sometimes two, three, four months ahead of time, that's when you buy your tickets for some of those things. With accommodations, um, the biggest tip I will give you about booking accommodations is figure out what kind of traveler you are. Some people, when they travel, they don't need specific amenities in wherever they stay. Some people can sleep on a concrete floor. I need a comfortable bed and lots of pillows. So I knew those were things that were going to affect where we stayed on our trip. And when we booked our accommodations, we used booking.com, which is a site that I cannot recommend enough. They make the booking process really, really easy. And they have a really good cancellation policy. And no, I'm not sponsored. I just really like their site and they made it really easy. You can also get 10% off sometimes when you use the mobile app so save yourself a few bucks and book on the mobile app um, that's what we use to book all of our hotels and we did stay in one Airbnb on our trip in Kyoto and I've seen this question come up a few times in groups which is like I'm so scared to book an Airbnb like how do you know you get a good one best thing to make sure you get a good Airbnb is to filter specifically for properties that are run by a super host that is a status on Airbnb that means that host, that um, status means that the 90% of the reviewers have left a positive review. They have had over a hundred stays. They have maintained a particular um, customer service level and they don't really have any complaints or negative reviews, any um, kinds of disputes or anything like that. So if you are nervous about booking an Airbnb, just make sure you filter by Superhost and read the reviews. The place we stayed at in Kyoto was the best place I think we stayed our whole trip. It offered a king size bed. It was like a little mini hostel, but there were only two rooms on each floor. It had an elevator. They washed our clothes and the bed was the most comfortable bed that we had been in on our entire trip. And it was in a cute neighborhood in near Shijo Station. And I can't say enough good things about that property. I'd be happy to leave a link below of the exact property and the host but yeah that is the biggest tip i can give you if you're going to book airbnb when you're booking your accommodations there are a few things you might want to ask yourself and your travel buddies which is what is important to you with where you're staying for some people the cost is going to be more important than what you get in the room or size or bed offering or whatever for us we wanted to make sure we had a comfortable bed it the property if it was a hotel offered a breakfast option so we wouldn't have to figure out breakfast every morning we could just go downstairs the property offered luggage forwarding because we were forwarding a lot of our luggage we also wanted to make sure it was near a major station since we were going to be traveling on trains a lot and then we also paid attention to room size and the size of the bed because we did want to make sure that we had enough room to put our luggage because rooms in Japan are small they are so mall.com.biz.gov like shoebox small. So if you are traveling with a lot of big suitcases, you will want to pay attention to that to make sure that you can navigate around your room. Or if you don't care, you might be fine stubbing your toe on your suitcase. I was not. So 
yeah. So when we first arrived in Tokyo, we stayed in the Ginza neighborhood near Tsukiji, kind of. We wanted to stay near there because we were going to, um, I wanted to just stay in Ginza because I don't know, I'm bougie, even though we didn't even shop in Ginza, we shopped everywhere else. But that was the neighborhood we stayed in and we did like the hotel. The neighborhood we stayed in in Kyoto was near Shijo Station, which again, I would recommend the Airbnb time and time again. In Osaka, we stayed near Shinsaibashi Station and we did enjoy that property as well. That place offered a decent breakfast and it was like across the street from a McLaren dealership, which was really interesting. I think it was a McLaren dealership. So it was really cool to like look out our window in the lobby and see McLarens across the street. And then when we went back to Tokyo before we flew out, we stayed in Asakusa near Sinsoji Temple and I definitely enjoyed that area as well. You'll find that different parts of neighborhoods offer different kinds of options for shopping, food, and those kinds of things. So do explore that option if you can. Total for all of our accommodations, we stayed a total of 11 nights and we spent $1,288.43, which I think was a pretty good deal. When you're using any kind of site to book hotels, just play around with pricing, offerings, ratings, those kinds of things. If you are traveling on a budget, there are capsule hotels, there are business hotels, there are smaller hotels. It just really depends. I've heard that capsule hotels can be cheaper, but we're a couple. We wanted to be comfortable. We didn't want to like we wanted to be comfortable, so we prioritized comfort over budget, but there are a lot of budget options in Japan as well. Just use, use the internet at your disposal to find those accommodations. Once we really solidified, we're going to be in Tokyo for two days, we're gonna to go to Kyoto for three days, Osaka for three days, and then back to Tokyo. That's when we figured out, yes, we're gonna need a JR Pass. There are plenty of other videos and websites that will recommend the JR Pass or not recommend the JR Pass. For us, it made sense to get it because we were going to be traveling through different cities. I'm not gonna talk about whether or not you should get it because you should really do your own research to figure out if it's worth it. There are calculators on the internet that will tell you Again, for us, it made sense. We got the seven day JR pass and we activated our JR pass the third day of our trip. So when we went to Kyoto, that was the day we activated our JR pass and then we had the full seven days to use it. And then we ended in Tokyo and our JR pass was up over at seven days and it worked out perfectly. But for the JR pass, that is something you need to buy in your home country before you leave. So you're gonna wanna figure that out. I say at least two to three weeks before your trip to make sure that your JR voucher gets to your home country in time before you leave your before you leave for your trip. When you are trying to figure out transportation costs, you also want to think about how are you going to get from the airport to your hotel when you arrive. If you're traveling to Narita Airport, that airport is like an hour away. So you're either gonna need to take a train to Tokyo or you can take a bus. We took a bus, which was actually really, really comfortable. And we were able to get a little bit of sleep and it was like 10 bucks. So you could activate your JR pass and take the Narita Express or you could take the Keisei, the Keisei, is it the Keisei bus? No, it's the Skyliner. I think it's the Skyliner train, which goes to a couple different cities in Tokyo. There's a lot of research you're going to want to do when you figure out how to get from the airport to your hotel when you arrive and then back from your hotel to the airport. But there's plenty of options out there. Other transportation you'll need to think about is how are you going to travel within the different cities that you're in. You're probably going to want to get a Suica card or a Pasmo card, some kind of IC card to take the trains and buses in the cities. You can also use your Suica card to pay for things like at vending machines and stores, which we ended up doing a few times. I thought that was really cool. There's also an app that you can download so you can just boop your phone and that acts as your, it's like, you know, like Apple Pay or whatever. Um, so you will likely need to get one of these passes. Some people pay for their trips as they go, which I feel like is a lot of work. Um, why keep going to the station to get the exact amount and then do all that like travel planning? I, I just get the card. We originally loaded up $30 on our Suica card and I think we had to refill it like four or five times on our trip. 
We took the train a lot and the buses. So we, I think we probably spent around a hundred dollars on um, buses and trains on top of our JR pass. So just kind of factor that into your budget. Other than that, when planning out transportation, you'll want to think about how are you going to get around in the cities? We planned out our routes a little bit ahead of time, just loosely. It was on the bigger days where we were going to be going from different temples to different castles and so on. So that's when I kind of took a little bit more time to just kind of get my bearings to know when were we going to have to switch to a bus more than likely or when are we going to have to switch trains you can use google maps on your phone it works perfectly in japan it, you'll be fine it'll be in whatever your native language is and it works perfectly fine totally accurate you don't need to download any other apps you can but i found that google maps was the most reliable and then the stations in japan are like really really just they do a really good job of helping people figure out where to go if you are Japanese. They had lines on the floor because there's different colored trains in Tokyo. They had lines on the floor that would tell you where you need to go to get to the different stops and the different stations within Tokyo Station. So I thought the lines on the floor were really nice to help people figure out how do they get to the next station number. Um, because the stations are like really big and there's a lot of different trains. So, um, yeah. Real quick, I wanna talk about budgeting and saving because that is often a question that comes up. How do you budget? How do you save? Like, can we talk about numbers for a second? Yes, I will talk about numbers. I will also preface this and say that budgeting, we were not holding ourselves to a very strict budget. We were just going to save what we could ahead of time and spend whatever we needed to spend. We had eight months to save for our trip. So when I was saving for Japan, I factored in how much roughly is the JR pass going to be? What would be a good number that I would feel comfortable with with shopping? Because I knew I was going to shop. I wanted to buy Lolita. I wanted to buy some casual J fashion brands. I wanted to buy lots of snacks. I wanted to go to Daiso and so those kinds of things. So I did try to put a number as far as how comfortable would I be spending. My number was $3,000, which I feel like might be high for some people, but for some people that might be low. I know people who go and spend way more. But for me, that was a number that I was comfortable with spending. So I said, $3,000, all right, let me start saving up money towards that goal. This did not include lodging. This did not include any transportation. That number also didn't include any of our food. This was just strictly on shopping. That was the amount of cash that I was going to dedicate to my trip. I didn't really use my credit card i think i used my credit card like twice in japan but those were for like smaller purchases japan is a very cash heavy society so just be prepared to have your debit card working or be prepared to take out cash also on the note of taking out cash in japan you don't need to exchange currency before you go all you need is a 7-eleven which are everywhere and you'll be fine you can pull money out of the 7-eleven and you're good you don't need to worry about exchanging money and any of that. You can go as soon as you get off the, the airplane in the airport, or you can go when you get your breakfast and your boss coffee at 7-Eleven. Also with the budget, we didn't really say there was a specific amount of money you wanted to spend a day. There are some people who were like, oh, I only want to spend $100 a day. That was going to be too hard to keep track of. So we were just like, stay where we want to stay, be comfortable. We didn't want to spend over $170 a night on a hotel. So that's how we figured out how much to put into our hotel. We also didn't put a price tag on food. We ate what we wanted to eat. We did know we wanted to go to a Michelin rated restaurant. So we did factor that into our budget. It would probably be like $100 a person for dinner. So we factored that in as well. Those are all things to kind of factor into your budget. What are you shopping for? Are you buying a lot of gifts for people? That's something you'll want to think about. And what is your budget for those different gifts? I wanted to bring a lot of omiyage for my friends and my coworkers and family. So I kind of set a budget for each person that I was buying gifts for. And then that was really where I think I budgeted the most. Everything else just kind of fell in line with like, what do I feel comfortable with spending? 
Your most expensive things on your trip are obviously going to be your plane tickets, your accommodations. At the end, I'll try and do a recap of how much money we spent total, but it's going to be really rough. So things to do to help you save along the way is to stop spending as much. Obviously, for those of you who are Lolitas, don't buy Lolita. You can buy it in Japan. Yes, friend, you could buy it in Japan. Don't buy from Closet Child. You can shop at Closet Child when you go. Those were some of the biggest things that really factored into me being able to square away money. And then once October hit, I was like, cool, this is what I got. This is what I'm gonna spend. Here we go. I also paid things over time. So our Airbnb, you usually have to pay half before you half when you book and then you have to pay the rest of it before your trip so that was already paid off our hotels we didn't need to pay until we got there but we had factored that into our budget um, the JR pass you have to book before you go your airplane you have to book before you go your bus tickets and all of that you have to book before you go or you can book it when you get there so a lot of your most major expenses especially if you're doing Airbnb you're going to pay for before your trip so um, do keep that in mind when you are saving and budgeting is that you're going to have to pay for things before your trip. A lot of things you're going to have to pay for before your trip. I was also super realistic about my shopping as well. I, I'm not the kind of person who goes shopping and just balls out of control. I set limitations on myself. Like I said, $3,000 was my limit on how much I wanted to spend on shopping for myself and everyone else. And that's just what I tried to follow. There are some people who can just be like, I wanna buy anything I see, everything I see, whatever, I don't care. Friend, do you, but Christmas was right around the corner. We had other things that we were also spending money and budgeting and saving for as well. So it just, I was very realistic about it. Okay, so I'm gonna try and speed this video up. Shopping, this is the whole reason, but that was like primarily why I went. When shopping in Japan, the two biggest tips that I will give you, friend, is one, be strategic about your shopping. The same way that you meticulously plan out your itinerary, you're going to want to meticulously plan out your shopping. Make a list of all of the specific shops that you want to visit and then plot out how are you going to get to them. Are they in the same area? Are, it, are they in the same complex? Shibuya 109 and La Forêt are not in the same place. They're in two different places. So I thought I was gonna be able to do both on one day. I didn't, it didn't happen. So be strategic, plot out your shopping trip and the places you want to go and be prepared for all of the bags. Maybe you need to bring a big bag to consolidate. Like you're gonna have a lot of bags, you're gonna be hustling and bustling. So just be strategic about your shopping plan and make an actual like roadmap, essentially. Make a map. Okay, and then prioritize which ones are most important and on which days you're going to do that because you're not gonna be able to do it all in one day. I'm telling you, you're gonna burn yourself out. If you are going with friends, don't be afraid to split up. If shopping is super important and you wanna to go to a place and your friends don't wanna go, you might have to shop by yourself. And as fun as it is to shop with friends, sometimes you're gonna to have to split off if you wanna to go to the Lizley's store and no one else wants to go to Shibuya 109. The second tip that I can give you is to be prepared to buy things that you didn't want to buy. I was not prepared to buy things in different cities, like at different temples or different pictures, figurines, all kinds of stuff that I ended up getting. And not that I didn't need to be prepared because of budget wise, it was because of a luggage wise. We bought so much stuff that we had to send two boxes home. We were not, we didn't think we were gonna buy as much stuff as we bought. Um, Anthony especially, he ended up buying like seven bottles of alcohol from the Yamazaki distillery because it's just really good whiskey. So just be prepared for that either in the form of another suitcase or just be prepared to have to send some boxes home. If you are in Tokyo, I would strongly recommend going to the Samurai Museum. It was, it's in Shinjuku and we, that was one of our highlights of our trip. The tour guides were hilarious. 
Um, they spoke really great English and it was really, really cool to see the different armor. They were real armor and, and you got to learn a lot about the different periods in Japan, the way of the samurai, all kinds of things. They had a really cute gift shop and we really enjoyed our experience there and I would highly recommend it if you are at all fascinated by samurai, if you are in Kyoto and you are a whiskey fan, or even if you're not and you just wanna learn more about good whiskey, I strongly recommend the Yamazaki Distillery. They do a tour. It's one of the best $10 we spent on our whole trip. We got a tour of the distillery and they had a tasting at the end where you get to make a highball and try different Japanese whiskeys. They also have a really cool, it's like a, it's kind of like a museum where they have different whiskeys on display. They also have a tasting room and they have a really great gift shop. We had a really great time. It's a little bit of a trek from the station that you get dropped off at to the actual distillery itself, but you get to walk through some cute neighborhoods and it was well worth the trip. When we went to the distillery, we actually ran into a guy. We noticed he had like, he had like a, a American accent and we were like, oh, hey, where are you from? And he's like, I'm actually from Portland. We ran into a guy in Kyoto on the other side of the world from Portland, Oregon. I would also recommend if you're in Tokyo and you are going to be taking the Shinkansen, arrive at the station two to three hours early and explore the station. I think Tokyo Station is like really underrated. I didn't, I like I heard Tokyo Station had a lot of shopping, but I wish we would have spent half a day in Tokyo Station just shopping. There were so many amazing places that looked really good to eat and there's like a mall. I mean, to be fair, there's a mall like everywhere in Japan, but Tokyo Station, underrated. Wish you would have spent more time there. If you can do it, spend a few hours in Tokyo Station. I also really enjoyed going to Don Quixote and all of the different places that it was at. I know it's pretty cliche and like, oh, that's such a like touristy thing to say, but I, Don Quixote is everything. And I was always amazed every time I went and I got all my snacks from there. I got all my Haru hot packs from there. Like I just, if it's not on your list, hit up a donkey. Nishiki Market in Kyoto. If you're in Kyoto as well, please make sure you also take a few hours to go to Nishiki Market. It is a cool outer market. There's a lot of food vendors as well as shops. We visited a few custom chopstick engraving places. We also got some cool um, textiles and things like that. And we also tasted some really tasty food. It is a bit busy, especially on the weekends. So just prepared for crowds, but I do recommend Nishiki Market. Market. We had a lot of fun there. If you are a drinker and you're in Kyoto, Bar Jigen was an amazing, I loved Bar, the, the owner of Bar Jigen, Tanaka-san is, he has a pocket translator, so he tries to communicate with his patrons of the bar and we ended up going two nights in a row. And he made some of the best drinks I had tasted on our entire trip. So I do recommend that place as well. One of the things I don't hear talked about often are regrets. So I will tell you guys some of the regrets I have about our trip. One of the regrets that I have is like I mentioned earlier, our itinerary was very stacked. I tried to stack things in the morning, afternoon and evening to make sure that we maximized our time on our trip. But in hindsight, I wish I wouldn't have done that because we didn't leave any room to explore and to just kind of see where the day takes us. And I wish I would have done that a little bit more. We are planning for our next trip, hopefully in 2022. So one of the things that I am keeping in mind is we're only going to do one major thing a day that we actually have planned. And then the rest of the day, we'll see where it takes us. I want to do a lot more exploring. And that is something that I would definitely recommend um, when you're planning your trip is to don't stack too much stuff on your trip because you will miss out on exploration part of going to a new country.
I also regret not chatting more with locals. There were some bars and izakayas that we went to where we did have good conversations with locals and other tourists that were there. But I do regret not doing more of that. And I think that just ties into not being able to explore more. Um, it is really good learning about the different um, people that live there, the different offerings. Some of the locals had really good recommendations for restaurants to visit. And I wish we would have done that more because that just would have really helped our experience feel not just like we're going to all these touristy popular things but we're also interacting with the locals there i learned a little bit of japanese before i went and every time i would try to converse with someone in japanese they'd be so surprised that i at least tried but we learned a lot about each other and where we're from and they're generally just really curious so long as you're a decent person so yeah i do regret not doing that more and i do want to incorporate that more on our next trip i regret getting a pocket wi-fi didn't need it Fun fact, if you have Sprint slash T-Mobile, I don't know if this works now, it did because we had Sprint before they merged, your phone works for free in Japan. It works on the SoftBank network and you don't get charged any international fees for calling or texting. So we didn't need a pocket Wi-Fi. All of our calls and all of our data were covered under our current cell phone plan no charges whatsoever in addition to our unlimited plan. So in hindsight, I wish I wouldn't have got a pocket Wi-Fi, but now I know I will double check next time before we go to make sure that we're covered in case we do need to get one. But that was just a waste of what, $70, $80 that we didn't need to spend. I also regret not staying in a Ryokan. I don't know if you were planning on staying on one. That is one of the traditional experiences when people go to Japan is that they stay in a really nice Ryokan with an onsen. So that is something that I will be definitely incorporating into our next trip because I do wanna be able to have that nice, relaxing, traditional Japanese experience. And I also regret not getting more videos and pictures with my friends and aunt Anthony. I did get a lot of video footage on my phone because I was trying out using like a gimbal and vlogging and that kind of thing. Um, I do think next time I go, I will definitely bring my real camera and my super wide lens and making more um, videos and taking more pictures. But um, I do regret doing that. So I will be doing that more the next time we go. Okay, so let's get to the parting tips portion because this has already been a long video. Are you still hanging in there? You all right back there? How you doing? First of all, let's talk about total. How much did we spend on our trip total in Japan? I know that's a question that gets asked a lot. I have rough numbers, super rough numbers, but just to recap, we went for 12 days, 11 nights. We had round trip tickets from Portland to Narita Airport. We went in late October through early November. With all of that being said, lodging, we spent $1,288.43. For the round trip tickets to and from Portland to Narita Airport, upgraded leg room and our JR pass and our tickets from the airport to our hotel, from our hotel back to our airport was $1,761. Doesn't include our local transportation costs, so just throw in an extra $100 per person for all of our local trains and buses. So we're looking at close to $2,000 total for transportation. Factor in around the $3,000 that I had budgeted for shopping and food. Roughly, I estimate that we spent about $6,500 total for two adults. I don't have exact numbers, unfortunately, because ain't nobody got time to be going back through bank statements and seeing how much money I pulled out at 7-Eleven. I think next time, whether or not we hit that number, I think it will be different. I don't think I will be doing as much shopping and I think I'll be doing more experience related things. Bring two pairs of tennis shoes and some very comfortable socks and insoles. Another tip is to be respectful of the culture. I didn't really talk much about this, but Japan does have different cultures. They have a completely different culture. Obviously, if you know anything about Japan and just be observant of that and do your best to be respectful of that. That includes not eating or drinking while you're walking. That includes lowering your voice. That includes bowing. Also, that includes not taking pictures when you're not supposed to take pictures and videos. Just be respectful of the culture and don't ruin it for the rest of us, please. Don't give us all a bad name. And then the last tip is to just soak it all in. Enjoy your time in Japan and just soak in the fact that you're in a completely new country with different people and there's so much to see and it is 
it is like a night and day difference i felt like tokyo and any anywhere i've been in the u.s so um just soak it all in and enjoy it so that was my super long Japan travel planning video. I hope you got a good idea for how we planned our trip and what worked really well for us, as well as some tips on how to plan your trip. Um, I did do a Q&A if you haven't watched that. One of the questions that came up, which was, how are you even planning your trip right now? Um, and the answer that I gave to that was that we're not really planning our trip. We're just, I'm using the books to kind of figure out where would we go, where would we want to go? How much will we be looking at cost so we can start saving enough now for that because we are also planning a wedding. I think we're going to look early next year as to when would be a reasonable time to go and it'll either be the end of next year or early 2022 is when we would be doing our next trip and we're trying to figure out cities, things to do and all of that. So you are able to plan even though there is a pandemic with fingers crossed, hoping that at some point we'll be able to travel again. If not, I'll just have a bunch of money saved and I can spend it somewhere else. But seriously, we're all hoping that like we can go to Japan again because we're both dying to go back. Um, we loved it so much and there's so much more stuff to see. So yeah, if you have not been to Japan, I hope that you found this video helpful. Or even if you have, I hope you found this video helpful and you learned a few tips. And if you have any questions about anything that I've gone over today, please be sure to leave a comment and let me know and I will get back to you as best as I can. I'll be doing some more Japan planning videos. I don't know what they'll be about just quite yet. Um, I like to do one on packing. I'll be doing a packing video because packing was something that I had a good time trying to figure out as well as like travel necessities. And for people who like are nervous flyers like myself, I do have a lot of flight tips about that. I have mad anxiety when it comes to flying. I have not traveled several times before because I hate flying that much. I was incredibly anxious up to the point where when we were traveling, I was second guessing whether or not I really wanted to go when we were in the airport in my head. But I got on the plane and I actually did pretty good. So I will be doing a video on that to help those of you who are also nervous flyers and some things that might help you out. And um, yeah. Anyway, stay tuned for all of my future videos for Japan planning, as well as my other videos. I talk a lot about Lolita on this channel if you haven't checked out those videos or didn't know. So go ahead and check out those videos. I'll leave a link to some playlists that you can check out. And uh, yeah, I feel like I've talked enough though. I've talked a lot. I talked way too much and this video is gonna suck to edit, but I really appreciate you guys for watching and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.